is the, the second part of the UV map cereal box tutorial. Uh, at this point, you should have completed the unfolding of the UV map and hit to automatically open up Photoshop. If not, you can locate your Photoshop file by going into the source images of your project folder. Um, so here we have the UV map and we are going to start decorating and changing this this box. Now you'll notice on mine that some of the lines are missing. Uh, the reason for that is it's just a resolution issue. The lines are very very thin um, which is actually on purpose. If you zoom in you can see that the lines are in fact there. So you don't necessarily need to worry about that. Now if you've never used Photoshop before one of the greatest things about Photoshop is the layers and, the, and what you can do with the layers. Um, but also one of the problems is as students uh, try Photoshop for the first time um, when, with this project, they start coloring right on the UV map layer. Um, and we want to use the UV map layer as a reference because we don't want any of these white lines to show up back when we return to Maya. So right here where you see UV snapshot, I'm going to select that layer and just lock it down because I don't want to mess with that layer at all. I want to leave that layer alone. Now if you're looking at your screen and it doesn't quite look like mine, you can always reset your screen to be the to the essentials. That's usually what I work in in Photoshop just because it's it's kind of the default set. And I hit a hotkey with my hand and have to remember how to get it back. Perfect. I hit tab. If you hit tab, it goes to ex from expert mode back to the regular view. Um, so right here uh, in the upper corner you see this little icon. This allows you to change to different uh, view modes like you've got a 3D uh, screen, you've got graphic and web screen, you've got motion graphics screen, painting screen. And these are all just designed to help those different artists um, maximize their workflow. But we're just going to use the essentials. And if you need, if needs be, you can even hit reset essentials, and that resets your workspace back to the default. So right here is this is my default workspace. Um, this is my canvas that I'm going to draw on, and then these are my layers over to the side. Now with this particular file, part of the reason that I use PSD networks rather than U, than uh, UV snapshots is this is it's all over here in the layers. Um, when you add additional nodes, so uh, right now I'm just using the color node, but if you add a bump node or a transparency node or uh, a luminance node, uh, each of those are going to show up as their own folder. So because of that, when Maya looks at this file, it is going to look specifically in the color folder to shade this map. So right here where it says Lambert 2 color, I want to make sure that everything I create sits inside of that Lambert 2 color. So one of the first things that I like to do, especially with this project, is I like to change the background color, uh, the overall color of my box. Sometimes people like to use gradients, and it's actually not a problem to use a gradient. The only issue is you're going to have some weird seams. Because remember, this is a 3D object, which means that this edge and this edge are identical. So if you have a gradient that comes out this way, and, and so it starts out strong here and goes over here. I'll just show you an example. So if I, if I have a gradient that I've created, this side over here is black, this side over, ugh, this side over here is yellow. So that means when this, see, this edge and this edge meet, you're going to have a really definitive line. If we create as one solid color, uh, we, we won't have that issue. So let me just throw this layer in the trash real quick. I'm going to create a new layer. Down here there's a little icon that looks like a post-it note. That creates a new layer. This new layer is in fact sitting in the Lambert 2 color folder, which is what I want. Uh, so now I'm going to use my paint bucket tool to just fill the entire background with a solid color. On the side, these are all of your tools in, in Photoshop. Okay, uh, Well, I shouldn't say all of your tools. These are most of your tools over here in Photoshop. As you look at these tools, they have there's a little triangle pull-down menu. Okay, That triangle pull-down menu means that there are additional options. 
Uh, for whatever reason, this gradient comes in as the default instead of the paint bucket tool. So where it's, you see the gradient, if you click and drag out, you can see there's a paint bucket tool. So I want the paint bucket tool and I want to fill in the background. Now I don't want black. I actually uh, want to try to look at some of the color psychology that we discussed earlier and, and make a decision on my box color from that point. Now the colors red, yellow, and orange are really, really strong colors to use uh, if you're trying to sell a food item, especially cereal. Um, but because I've decided to create uh, brownie bites, um, going off of, uh, playing off of my name a little bit, uh, I want to use the color brown um, and to try to in let people know just how chocolatey and delicious my uh, cereal is. So brown is kind of a hard color to find when you're in Photoshop. Um, there are a couple of different places that you can change the color. Now in the essentials, I have a color swatch right here, and I have two colors that I can uh, uh, switch between. Uh, I can also come over here, you see this icon and this icon are the same. So if I click on this button right here, it opens up a color picker. You can use, of course, the, the, the little eyedropper tool or kind of come in and, and try to find it here based on these hues. If you know uh, hex code or, or some of the other things, you can actually type in the hex code number here if you're working in the web. Um, if you're working with uh, print, you have CMYK, so it's cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, HSB, which is hue, saturation, and uh, I, usually it's a V for value. I don't know if B stands for balance or what. Um, so if you know those values, you can actually type them in. I'm not even going to worry about that. I'm just going to try to find a good one based on uh, the, the, uh, the little color hue here. So like I said, browns are usually a, a, towards the orange family. If you kind of take in darker oranges, usually that makes brown. That to me is a perfect color of brown and I fill in my background. Okay, so what direction you go from here is totally up to you. Um, I usually like to work with my text first and then try to fit the pictures into the text. Um, I'm going to work with the existing fonts that I have, but realize you could, if you, uh, if you're, you look at the fonts that are available to you and you think they're boring and terrible, you can always go to the internet. There's a website called thefont.com. And at thefont.com, they have thousands of free fonts that you can use, um, that you can download and use for free. Most of the time, they are just for projects and not, uh, not using them for uh, making money. Uh, so if you plan on selling your cereal box design, you, you want to check uh, what the author of the font has, has put out there for, uh, for usage rights. Um, but again, where we're in an educational setting, um, we're pretty much safe to use any of these fonts as long as we're not uh, publishing our work uh, without giving proper credit. So lots of different, I mean, I, I just looked right here, there's, a, there's pixel fonts, looks like. There are retro fonts, army fonts, western fonts. Um, and then if you look, not only are, can you kind of base it around you know trying to find like a western or distort it you can also look under the some of the basics something with a sand without a serif uh, something with a serif um, a serif is just like the little um, a little fl flourishment uh, if you look here this the little addition to the font where a sans serif you don't have any of those little addition, additions. Um, I would recommend a nice big font, something that like Cool Vetica would actually probably be a pretty good font to use. Um, champagne and limousines would not be a good font to use because the lines are so thin. When you're creating a logo, when you're creating the, the, the design for the name of the cereal, it needs to pop so that as people are walking down the aisle, they go, oh, I wanted uh, brownie bites because look, at it's right there. Um, so I, I'm going to just use one of the fonts I have installed rather than go through the process of installing a font. But that is uh, something available to you if you would like. Okay, so fonts. Right here there's a T. This is my text tool. I, I, I'm going to warn you right now that sometimes uh, s students will just take and drag a little box. Then you're limited to that text box. It's not a bad idea, especially if you're working in a, in a confined area like I am. It's not a bad idea to make sure that your font sits inside there. 
Um, but I found it much easier that instead of creating a text box, I'm going to just drag that to the trash here. Instead of creating a text box, just click the text title once, and then you can start typing and change the size, and you can always manipulate how it sits later. Now, if I start typing, you notice you can't see any of the font that I typed. I can highlight it, and then you'll see it. The problem is, is my font color matches this brown background. So to, to have a good contrast, you may want to look up and see what a good contrasting color with brown would be. Um, but I'm going to use, I'm just going to use white. Uh, I think white will work out really well. You could use a, like a cool blue color because that's a great contrasting color. But I'm just going to use white, white font. Okay, so I've got white font. I click OK. Right now I'm using this adorable font. Let me scroll through my fonts and kind of see what I have up here in the top. So. I neglected to tell you, when you click on any, t any of these tools and you look at the top bar, you're going to see a lot of options for those tools. So if, for instance, if I clicked on the paint bucket tool, you see I have some options for the paint bucket tool. Uh, clicking on the type tool, I have all of these tools that you're probably used to using from like Microsoft Office or, uh, or using the Google Docs or whatever the case may be. Um, I'm going to highlight the text and I'm going to click down and this are all of the different sample texts. Apparently I have Apple emoji texts as well that when you look behind me they're not working. Um, but I want to find a nice font that's got a, it's got a big fat letter to it. So nothing simple, nothing simple like the Alien League which I downloaded, something more like the adorable font which I've been using a lot lately. Um, as I scroll down, you know what, I like, I like this bubblegum font. Let me see, let's see what I can do with it. I may, I may change my mind about that but for right now I'm going to use that bubblegum font and I'm going to type in brownie on one line. I'm going to hit enter and do bytes on the other line. Now you could left justify if you felt like it or right justify kind of depending on uh, you know what you want to do. I'm going to center justify this and I may change that later. Um, in Microsoft Office there's something called word art that allows you to to pick a font and pick a pick a size and then you can kind of you know embellish it or whatever. In Photoshop, there's this little text warp tool, uh, and I'm going to use that text warp tool to adjust my uh, my font here. So with this, with my text selected, let me click off that. With my text layer selected, I'm going to come to the text tool and click on the warp text. Right now it says style none. If I go to arc, you can see it's arcing my uh, my my title there. Now, as you look online or or in my book of serials, you'll see that a lot of serial boxes use the same kind of font. In fact, why don't we just do a quick Google search to show you that? So I'm just going to look up a uh, serial box designs, and a lot of these will be. Uh, handmade. There's this this uh, Loopy Tutus uh, is a, a tutorial, a uh, Photoshop tutorial, essentially doing what I'm doing right now. But if you look, so here is Frosted Flakes. You can see there's a slight arch to the to the font there. Captain Crunch. The letters are kind of set uh, offset a little bit. Fruit Loops. We have again same similar to Frosted Flakes, but may, but on a little bit more of an angle. Fruity Pebbles. We have an angle. Mr. T. We have an angle. Cocoa Puffs is kind of that round look right there. Reese's Puffs is on an angle there. Fruitos, that's kind of on an angle there. Here we have a Frosted Flake that's that's straight. We have a Trix that's straight. Frankenberry and Booberry, um, they're, they're in the corner in a little. But, but looking at all of the different designs, that can help to influence uh, what your cereal looks like. And in my case, I'm going to look at the uh, I want to look at the arc maybe. Um, and then on the arc, if you looked at, like I said, looking at those examples, you saw that they kind of were smaller on the left-hand side and got bigger on the right-hand side. Let me, just, let me turn my bend down just a little bit, do a little bit of horizontal distortion. Oh, I want to do it the other way. So something, something like this. Um, maybe I don't want to do an arc. Maybe I want to try... A bulge? Yeah, well, I don't know. You can play around with these different, with the different designs, and, and see if there's one that you like better than others. Um, I don't like as that much horizontal distortion. Let me zero that out. I think I'm gonna just 
leave the default values here for the bend, maybe push that out just a little bit, something like that. There's, that's my text. Hey, okay. how you do that's up to you. If you want to just kind of leave it normal, that's fine. Now, right now, if I saw this in a, in a grocery store, I probably wouldn't pick it up. That, that title is really small. I, I have to actually get in and see what Brownie Bites looks like. So I want to make that a little bit bigger. So to make something bigger in Photoshop, there's two ways to do it. You either go to Edit, Free Transform, or if you notice, right next to it, there's these little uh, characters. That tells me that that's a hotkey for Free Transform. Command T is the hotkey. When I do that, it gives me these transformation tools. Now I can click on them and just drag out my font and, and, and change the size that way. Um, I prefer to try to keep everything in the uh, kind of in order. I don't like stretching or squashing out my, my text most of the time. So if I go to the corner and I hold shift on my keyboard, as I drag and make that bigger, it's going to keep it in proportion. Okay, so it's not going to distort like this distorts or this distorts. Um, I actually may want to distort it just a little. No, I, th I think that's good. I think I'm going to keep that just like that. Brownie Bites. Okay, there's, there's the title of my serial. Now, you can always add extra little embellishments um, in, in individual pieces. Uh, I re when, you're, when I'm doing font like this, um, printing this out on a box, um, the, the B is the, the letters are going to kind of blend into the background a little. So I want them to pop a little and I maybe make the, the letters look a little bit 3D. A really easy way to do that in Photoshop is to double click the layer. It pulls up and you get these layer styles. Okay, So here, here are these layer styles. You can do lots of cool things. If all I do is just using the default settings, if I hit bevel and emboss, that right there makes them look like the, the letters are a little bit more 3D. And I can even come into individual options on the bevel and emboss and I can adjust those options to make things look a little bit uh, a little bit better. So actually, I usually don't do a bevel and emboss, but I like the way that looks, so I'm going to leave it. Um, I always like doing a stroke of just like a, a, a black outline on all of my on, on all of my objects there. Um, you can always increase the size. I'm going to leave this default. Just it was four pixels. That that looked good for me. Um, and then of course you have uh, the you have drop shadow, which is a really popular one to do as well. I'm going to use that drop shadow that makes that brownie bites look like it's just popping off the screen. Okay, um, I just want to take a look and see what this is looking like when I take it into Maya. I want to make sure that everything's going to fit and everything's looking good. So I'm just going to save the file. Now I don't want to change the name because remember Maya is looking for this specific file. If I change the name, Maya won't know what to look for. So I just saved it by, by hitting Command S. You can also go to File, Save. That works as well. But I'm going to pop over here to Maya, select my box. You can see that it updated over here, but I don't see anything over here. If I hit 6 on the keyboard, that may change that. If you make a change and it still doesn't show up, go to Image, Update PSD Network, and that should show up. If it still doesn't show up, it means that somewhere along the lines you've messed up. Meaning that over here in your Photoshop file, you put your text above that little fold, that lit, that color folder. So I'm just to demonstrate. I just bring this right over back into Maya. I'm going to go to Image, Update PSD Networks, and you see that my words disappeared. Again, it's because this layer is sitting outside of this layer two color folder. So uh, so I drag that back down. I'm going to save it. Come back to Maya. Go to Image, Update PSD Network, and there we go. And this is a way that I can kind of go back and forth between Maya and Photoshop and make sure that everything is looking the way that I want it to look. You may have noticed that when I brought this in that those layer styles that I created in Photoshop didn't show up over here in Maya. The reason for that is, is for whatever reason, it doesn't recognize these layer effects in Maya. So if I want these layer effects to show up, I have to do what's called rasterizing the layer. Basically what it does is it looks at all this information and it makes them pixels instead of a font and instead of all these effects. So I right click and hold on the layer and I hit rasterize layer style, rasterize layer style. Now, once you do that, you've lost the ability to edit those, to edit that font. So I can't come in and, and, and 
if I spelled brownie wrong, I can't go in and change that now. These are pixels. There's no changing those pixels. Um, so if I want to change the, f the font or the title or whatever, I'd have to actually go back in and create another text layer. But I, let's look and see what this looks like in Maya. So I'm going to hit Command S. Go to Maya. It, it auto-updated here. It didn't auto-update here. So let's go to Image, Update PSD Network. And now as I look, you can see that's so far so good. Okay. Um, now, that, that's font. Usually that's pretty easy. Um, the one thing that a lot of students struggle with is, is, is working with photos and kind of manipulating and changing photos. Uh, I know I'm already long-winded. I think we're already at the 20 minute mark, maybe not that long. But uh, I want to go ahead and take some photos and, uh, and, and manipulate them a little and show you how that can work. Uh, I may, we may have to split this up a little bit, but let's see what we can do. So it is brownie bites. So I want to be the mascot. I want to be the cartoon mascot. So I want to take a picture of myself. So I'm going to open up Photo Booth, uh, which is a built-in software into Maya using or in, a built-in software on a Mac using the webcam. As you can see, I've, I'm very narcissistic. I have lots of pictures of myself. Uh, I'm going to take a picture of myself uh, that I want to use for the cereal box cover. So something like I'm going to pretend to be holding. Let's see. I want to pretend to be holding a spoon and maybe a place for a bowl. So let's see what, I don't know if this is going to turn out, but we'll see. All right, I probably should not have the pen in my hand. Let's try this again. That doesn't make sense either. Let's try this again. Okay, spoon and bowl. You have to hit the button. <laughs> All right, that's still that's terrible. I <laughs> I gotta look at the camera. That'll work. I don't care. It'll work. I'm gonna use it. All right, so I'm just gonna drag this to my desktop. That's a that that's an easy place to store the file. To get it onto Photoshop, a couple of different ways. You can go to File Place, uh, File Place Embedded. I like embedding my files, and then navigating to that file. You can also just drag and drop it in on, onto your thing. And I'll show you that here in a second with the bowl. So I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to maybe go through this a little bit quicker, just uh, so I won't actually work on this. Um, so I may have to may have to just work on this on my own and then come back. Um, but here I have an image. Okay, I don't want the background. I want to get rid of the background. An easy way to get rid of the background. Well, let me take that back. It's not an easy way. It's conceptually easy, but it is tedious. And that is to just go to my eraser tool and start erasing. It says, oh, the smart object must be rasterized before proceeding. Okay. Basically what it means is when I brought the photo in, it didn't know what to do with it. It, it. it looked at it as a smart object, as an object that wasn't a series of pixels. And so when I rasterized it, I made it a series of pixels. So like I said, you can use the eraser tool and come in and just erase, um, but that can be pretty tedious. Uh, if you want to stretch yourself a little, there's a tool right up here. This one is called the magic wand tool. The magic wand tool, when you click on it, it selects like colored pixels. So this actually did a pretty good job with the exception of it's going to cut off my eyebrow right there. So I could use that, select it, hit delete, and it's going to delete that part of the picture. Like I said, it's got my eyebrow, which I don't want, so I'm going to undo that. So sometimes the magic wand tool is really, really powerful. Like right there, that's, that's a perfect uh, thing for me to get rid of. Okay? If I deselect it by hitting Command D or Edit Deselect, you can see that I haven't cut off too much of my ear or too much of my hair. I think that'll work. Okay. Um, sometimes it just doesn't. Like right here, this is coming into my neck and cutting into my neck. I don't want that. So I'm going to deselect this by hitting Command D or, or Select Deselect. And I'm going to use now, instead of the magic wand tool, I'm going to use this tool right here called the Quick Selection Tool. And the Quick Selection Tool is more like a brush. In fact, I can make the brush bigger or smaller um, by hitting the... Uh, braces keys. So just up above, if you look just up above your colon and your comma, um, there are two keys next to P uh, that are braces. You, you, the left braces is going to make it, the brush smaller, the right braces is going to make the brush bigger. Okay, so I'm just going to use that brush and kind of come along 
And as I as I paint, you see that it's it's actually doing a pretty good job of finding you know like-minded pixels. I'm going to hit delete. That deletes that. I'm going to deselect Command D, and I'm just going to come in and try to delete the background, delete as much of the background as I can. Like I said, this can be really easy or can be really tedious. It just depends on um, just depends on what kind of image you have and, and, and how, how well you're able to delete the background. So I, again, for, for sake of time, I'll come and do this later. Um, I'll, I'll get rid of all of my stuff later. Um, but that's how you kind of erase and start taking out parts of pictures. Um, so this is going to look a little funny until I actually get the file done. Um, but, but that's OK. Let's go to the internet and let's find me a picture of a, of a bull. So I'm just going to type in bull. Okay. Now, you see a lot of, there's a lot of white bowls here. Um, a white bowl is going to be a little bit harder to erase and, and do some things on. So I'm just, I really like this Ikea bowl. I've, I've never really seen that before, but this is going to fit perfect, especially with that. This teal color will fit real nice with that brown color. So I'm just going to drag this image in, I hope. Okay, let me drag it to my desktop first, see if it's saved. I don't know if it did. All right, looking here, let's see. Doesn't look like it saved this file, so let me right click and hit uh, Save Image As. Saving it to the desktop, there we go. And where did it save to? Right there. I'm gonna drag this over. Huh. Okay, I'm not gonna use that image. I really like that bowl, but uh, rather than sit and try to figure out what's wrong, I'm going to just try to drag another bull in. Okay, there's a bull. If I want to make it bigger, I hit Command T or Edit Free Transform. I'm going to stretch it out, make the bull a lot bigger. Hit Enter. That's still a decent size. Let me use my quick selection tool to go around the brush or go around the bull. Delete that. Now I have a bull. Command D. I'm going to set the bull right in there. The last thing I want to do is to get a picture of a brownie, and then um, I, then we'll just call this tutorial good for now. Hopefully, that gives you a little bit of insight into Photoshop. It's it's not a, it's not an extensive tutorial by any means, um, but it, it should hopefully get you started at the very least. So let me, uh, like I said, last thing I want to do um, is get a, a brownie, and, a, and you'll see why here in a second. So a brownie. Oh, this is perfect. Oh, that's like a giant image too. That's perfect. I'm going to just drag this over. Like I said, it's a giant image. So Command T or Edit Free Transform. I know. It's, it's brownie season. It's not really brownie season. It's pumpkin season. But maybe we could have pumpkin brownies. Okay. Again, using the quick selection tool, I'm going to try to get rid of all of the stuff that's not a brownie. Command D deselects. Uh, I'm just going to use my eraser tool to, to kind of finish the job. Got to make my eraser tool a little bit bigger. All right, just quickly, quickly, quickly trying to get the brownie isolated. Okay, uh, I want to make it smaller because I want this to actually sit inside of the bowl here. Okay, and there are a couple of things that I'll need to do to actually get it to work. But I'm going to get this into the bowl. The reason I wanted to do this is I wanted to show you how you duplicate something really quick. So this is my little brownie uh, bite that we have here. If I want to make a bunch of them, I go to my selection tool here on the left. And if I hold Option on the keyboard, when I hold Option and click on something, it's going to make a, a duplicate of that or a copy of that. And it's making another layer over here. So to make cereal, I can just hold Option and, and click a bunch of times. Now those are pretty uniform. So I probably need to later go into Command T and you know, change the rotation of them a little bit, uh, possibly even mirror them. But eventually I'm going to fill up my bowl with cereal. I'm going to save the file, come back into Maya, update my Photoshop network, and you can see that you know, it's, it's starting to come together. Now I'm going to work on this file separately and uh, as I continue other parts of the tutorial, you'll see that I have actually completed my brownie. But hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight into Photoshop. Uh, like I say, you can, you can spend a, a good year learning about Photoshop and still not know everything there is to know 
about this, this tool. But, but essentially what I want you to know is how to select items, how to drag them in, understanding the layers, uh, using the text tool, using the layer effects, using the paint bucket tool, the eraser tool, the quick selection tool, and the magic wand tool. And then, of course, if you want to draw, you, you can use the brush tool and, and play around with the different settings. And eventually, you'll figure it all out. So there's a lot to take in. Uh, we'll go ahead and stop the tutorial right now. And uh, I'll put this, I'll upload this. And uh, in our next tutorial, we'll, we'll talk about making some of the objects that we're going to put in our 3D scene.